There's Crooks running on the roof. You can see him. So is it not possible? You're saying it's not possible that shot number nine went all the way through Crooks and you had no way of knowing that because it was in the same wound that was further affected by shot number 10. You're saying that's not possible. There was no evidence on the body of that occurred. There you go, sir. That's different than impossible. The Trump Assassination Task Force met for the very first time to determine what went wrong there in Butler. You can see they gave us a press release on who is speaking and there were a bunch of people from the local law enforcement agencies who were there. We'll notice Edward Lenz is there, sergeant from the Adams Township Police Department. We've got Drew Blasco, patrolman from the Butler Township PD. John Harold, lieutenant, Pennsylvania State Police. Former U.S. Secret Service agent called Patrick Sullivan. Ariel Goldschmidt, doctor, medical examiner, all came in to testify. Now, as it stands, we're still trying to get to the bottom of what happened there in Butler. To date, the task force has done a bunch of stuff. Over a dozen requests for documents, 23 transcribed interviews, met with FBI and Secret Service. They've got 2,800 pages of documents. We read through a massive Senate report earlier this week on the show. If you missed that, be sure to check that one out. But on Friday, they also now passed legislation giving the Secret Service, or actually giving this task force, more power to investigate the second assassination attempt that happened in Florida. And so what we see is that apparently there was a little bit of a kerfuffle there in the afternoon part of this hearing saying from the New York Times that the Democrats walked out on the committee hearing. Oh no. Republicans called other Republicans who have military backgrounds who went and examined the site to talk about what they found. And the Democrats through a hissy fit. And so let's take a look at what happened in this hearing. You'll see that the membership is comprised of these folks, Mike Kelly, Mark Green, Dave Joyce, Ohio, Tennessee, Pennsylvania in the house, Laurel Lee from Florida, what's up? Michael Waltz was there. Clay Higgins, we'll see what he said. Pat Fallon, Jason Crow. We've also got Luis Correa, Madeline Dean, Glenn Ivey, Chris Houlihan, and Jared Moskowitz. You remember that guy. Was over for the Democrats. But let's zoom in on this because this hearing started started very interestingly with a video from the hearing that showed that they were able to see this guy a lot earlier than we suspected. And so let's listen in on how this hearing went down. On July 13th, this footage has never been released to the public and it has been edited to show relevant parts. The video, as you will see from the timestamp in the upper right hand corner, begins at 18.08 or six or eight minutes after 6 p.m. In the first 12 seconds of the video, you will see a figure serving circled in red, crossing the roofs of multiple AGR buildings. This man is Thomas Crooks. You will then see the patrol car begin moving toward the AGR buildings, and we lose sight of Crooks, but about 19 seconds into the video, he reappears. Again, we have circled him in red before we lose sight of him at about 20 seconds later. Now, we cut the video for length so it picks up at about a minute and a half later at 6.10 p.m. and 38 seconds. Here, you will see law enforcement around the AGR building. At this point, all law enforcement entities staffing the rally are aware that there is an individual on the roof of AGR, but they do not know he is armed. Behind the trees, you will see one officer attempting to lift another officer up onto the roof, and you will see that officer pull himself up and look to the left. According to that officer's interview with the task force, he sees Crooks with the long gun, and Crooks turns and points the weapon in his direction. The officer then falls to the ground, injuring his ankle, and radios that the man on the roof is armed at 11 minutes after 6. That portion of the video ends here. We know that the first shot from Crooks is fired just 32 seconds later. We will play the video now. All right, let's watch. Video This will take about now. 51 seconds. There we go. There's Crooks running on the roof. You can see him. Wow. He's pulling himself up right there. Jumped off, just got the gun pointed at him and runs back. Wow. Okay, that was I, I realize it's hard to, to see some of this, but so Crooks, as he makes his way across the roof, this is, by the way, a Pennsylvania State Police cruiser and has the dash cam. So you were able to see some things that nobody else was able to see, but I know it's, it's difficult. Lieutenant Harold, I'm going to direct the first line of questioning to you since this is state police footage. Footage and evidence show that Crooks was on the roof of the AGR building for over three minutes before shots were fired. Lieutenant Harold, please describe those few minutes leading up to the shots fired from your vantage point. My position when the shots were 
were fired. I was behind the stage. I can't answer to any questions regarding Mr. Crooks on the roof because I did not have that information. I was behind the stage. It was very loud. And if it was transmitted over our portables, I did not hear that. I had returned to my car briefly once the former president had taken the stage to retrieve a cell phone that had first net. And then I was returning back to the stage when the first shot rang out. Officer Blasco, same question. At that time, I was at Brady Paul and I was working my way over to the AGR building to assist other Butler Township units with looking for crooks. As I got to the water tower, I parked underneath the water tower and began to make my way to AGR. That's when the shots rang out. All right, so we get some more conversation about that. And this was another interesting exchange. So this guy is a Democrat, Jason Crow from Colorado. You know, without unity of command and effective communications, a unit cannot operate. One of the things I'm struggling with, this idea that there wasn't a single unified command station on site, the Secret Service did not establish that. Is that atypical in your experience? Would there normally be one command and control station to unify command and communications? Yes, that's very atypical. I am very surprised. Normally there will be an overall command post for the entire visit, and each site will have what's called a security room where radio traffic pertinent to that individual site is controlled. And the command post, the overall command post, should be the state, local police, Secret Service, and other federal partners that may be assisting. So this is very unusual that the way it turned out here at this site. Do you have any sense in this instance as to why that might occur? Are there instances when you're conducting an event you would do multiple command posts or can you not see why that would be the case? Well, to misnomer, Congressman, the multiple command posts, the Secret Service always has security rooms at individual sites and they may be termed a command post, but it's really a mini command post. There should be just one overall command post and each site has their own kind of communication center where information relative to that site will be transmitted. For example, the airport agents or security there really are not concerned what's happening at the other sites because they're only concerned about the airport. So there'd be security room just for the airport site. It's probably safe to say that, you know, time and speed is really important, right? Because the idea behind that, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but the idea behind that is if there's something identified as being wrong, a suspicious person, that has to be very quickly communicated, right? Yeah, Yeah, this is how it should happen. The protective detail is on one specific frequency, Secret Service frequency, and only the protective details on that frequency. The post standers are are on a second frequency and the tactical teams are on a third frequency but the other tactical teams monitor all three frequencies at the same time so if something happens at the security room's responsibility to immediately get on the radio on the details frequency and say there's an issue remove the protectee from the stage or cover and evacuate yeah. that's what's supposed to happen and that's what's drilled into every secret service agent because the detail agents don't forget they can't listen to all the other traffic they have to be rock solid on protecting president or the presidential candidate so their frequencies just for their individual movements. So in this instance, based upon what you know and what you heard from Commander Lentz and Mr. Blasco, a suspicious person was identified with a range finder. Pictures were taken of this person moving around a building, so much so that it, it drew the attention of one of the sniper teams who took pictures of it. If that information had been effectively communicated to the FBI, or if the FBI, I guess to rephrase that, had set up a communication system in a command post to receive that or information, the Service, rather. would that have been a situation where you would say protectee shouldn't go on stage? until we resolve this? Congressman Crow, you mean the Secret Service, not FBI? Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Secret Service, right. Yes, sir. What should have happened, in my opinion, is when the suspicious person was identified, the detail leader and the shift agent should have been told there's an issue we're working a suspicious person. And then at that point, it was probably would be inappropriate to remove the president from the stage. But the detail leader should know there's an issue. I may have to react quicker. So at a minimum, when there's a suspicious person, the detail leader and the shift agent should be told there's an issue. And in your experience, have there been situations when you've been on service as a Secret Service agent where that has come up, where you've had pause an event or respond to something until it's been addressed? Yes, that has happened during my career. I've never had a dramatic situation where we had to remove the president from the stage, but we've had situations where the shift agents are told, we got a situation, there's a suspicious person in the front row, and then you have to mitigate that. Usually the protective intelligence team will then come, take that person and conduct an interview, remove that person from the rope line as an example, and you don't have to take the president off stage or interrupt the president's movements. Yeah, sounds like a reasonable way to approach all of this. Too bad that guy is a former Secret Service agent and not a current Secret Service agent. Maybe we'd still have Corey Compator alive. Now, there were also problems with communication and we spent some time talking about this yesterday. Apparently, their radios were not even working at the Secret Service agency. In the local command post, there was no way for us to hear any of the Secret Service radio traffic. So for those of us who are of a certain age, I was in my early mid-20s during September 11th. This was almost exactly what I remember being the problem in terms of responding to September 11th, that there were all kinds of really 
well-intentioned, very well-trained people, but none of whom could hear one another or communicate with one another. It feels as though we haven't made a whole lot of progress on that. In your view, what would have been a better way to have this communication? Sure. It's not feasible to have everybody communicate on the same channel just because the amount of radio traffic. However, Unified Command Post, as we're all taught in many different FEMA classes, Unified Command Post solves that issue. Why yes, and I know that? Representative Crow mm. started this conversation with sort of being aghast at the fact that there were clearly more than one command post and that in some cases, my understanding is some people didn't even know that there were more than one command post and so that's certainly a gap too. So here we were with three minutes and every second counting and the Secret Service and the State Police weren't able to directly hear what local law enforcement actually saw Weird. because they didn't have that interoperability with local law enforcement frequencies and didn't have possession of those radios. Given how important that communication is in communicating in a crisis, clearly one of the findings of our investigation ought to be that there needs to be certainly reform in terms of the technological communications that are going on here. My colleagues had a little bit of extra time, and with my remaining time, I'd like to ask a question about the drones. I understand that the drone technology that the Secret Service had didn't work that day. My understanding is that the person who was trying to assassinate the former president's technology His did work, work that day. The last <laughs> question that I have for you is we're always oh, trying to solve for the last problem that we had, you know, a shooter, a sniper. To me, we should be solving for the future problems that we aren't seeing coming around the corner, and those are emerging threats such as drone technologies. Gentlemen, do you have anything that keeps you up at night that isn't sort of the traditional sniper on a rooftop? Yeah, I believe that, that we've probably all considered the emerging threat that would be coming from a drone. I would say at our level, I have no means to mitigate that at this point. And that's actually something that we can also help with, and Congress has pieces of legislation my, myself. All right, so they continue on there. Now, let's fast forward. We also had Clay Higgins was here, and I wanted to listen to a little bit of what he had to say, because he posted his own report, and he was also under the thesis, the theory that there was a first shot that went and exploded Crooks' gun. And so we were asking how many shots were there in total. Let's see what Higgins says. We're going to get to the bottom of everything that happened on J-13. We're going to determine what happened, when, precisely the timeline, what went right, what went wrong, where were their failures, where was their heroic action. We're going to thoroughly and calmly investigate the entire incident, attempted assassination of former President Trump, and we're going to provide an excellent report to the American people in December. So we're in the middle of this thing right now, and I have to cover a lot of territory in a very few minutes. Commander Lenz, you're the commander of the entire tactical unit for Butler County. That's a multiple agency unit that's assembled across the county, and you're in command. I just want to clarify that. Did you command and supervise the drone team on the morning of J-13 to observe and sanitize and clear the entire property, including the water tower? Spray it off. We had a private company that offered to fly a drone. They were under your command? Correct. Yeah, Thank under you. my... Yep. And was that sophisticated drone equipment? Or? As far as I understand it, yes. Yes, sir. So not the hosing off. Did you post two patrol response units at the water tower for J-13? I did not. I had no actual decision-making as far as the planning goes for where so the perimeter people... Was it your understanding that there were two patrol response units parked in the vicinity of the water tower on J-13? I do believe at some point there were. Okay, because we're trying to get to and was the water tower ladder, which is about 25 feet high, was it ever lowered that day? No. Regarding radio communications, in the pre-mission briefing, you were involved extensively in that in a couple of weeks prior to J-13, that's my understanding? Yes. Regarding radio communications with the visiting federal agencies with jurisdictional authority to protect the former president, the Secret Service, did Butler County ESU, your unit, provide particular radios for the Secret Service or set aside? side radios for the Secret Service. We did. You did. Did you personally call the Secret Service counter sniper teams and remind them to pick up their particular radios on the morning of J-13? So I had spoken to them at the walkthrough and offered the radios? That was on Thursday. Correct. And then the day of the rally, our sniper team leader, when they did their face-to-face, -face, he reminded them that the radios... Yes. Did they ever pick up those radios? They did not. So those two counter sniper teams for the Secret Service were posted up on roofs because the northern counter sniper team which did ultimately did not take a shot on crooks because their line of sight was blocked by a couple of trees. I believe in the southern counter sniper team, which ultimately did fire the killing shot at crooks. They were up on roofs by themselves, correct? Yes. Mr. Sullivan would have been helpful. You said it was absolutely unacceptable, but there did not be direct radio communications. Would it have been helpful for the Secret Service to pick up the radios that the Butler County ESU had provided for them and reminded them to pick up? Absolutely. Up, especially up on a roof, being isolated as these counter sniper teams are. 
Yes, sir. They didn't have that radio communication. No, it would have been Let helpful. me clarify that the local Butler County issue in command of all the local forces assisting Secret Service that day attempted to deliver radio communication to the counter sniper teams. My goodness, time rolls quickly. It does. I'd like to jump into shot number nine. Shot number nine. During the interviews with the Secret Service and FBI, they commonly step over shot number nine. They say crooks fired eight rounds and then the Secret Service fired a killing shot. Shot number ten. But there was a shot number nine fired, was there not, Mr. Lenz? There was. Okay, command, I'm going to quote from transcribed interview of Aaron Zalapone, tactical SWAT officer under your command that took shot number nine. He was deployed. He heard the radio traffic. He saw the commotion. He left his deployed position and ran into a position where he thought he might be able to get a shot on if there was a shooter up on a roof, somebody on a roof. He said seconds after that is whenever the first three shots were fired. So I hear the first three, crack, crack, crack. And at this point, I'm like, okay, where are we at here? I look up, that's when I see crooks. I got his head, his shoulders. I can see a rifle. At that point, I hear another crack. That's when I start pulling my weapon up. He gets three off. As I'm getting my target acquired, I'm getting my red dot up, I can see the gas emit from his barrel, his muzzle. Then right after that, I hear the snap of his fifth shot go off. Then immediately after that, I press one off, and that's when he immediately goes down. When I say goes down, it wasn't like he was ducking to get out of the way. I mean, I know I hit him like there's no doubt about it he goes down he kind of jerks to the right and then he slumps over slowly and then kind of slowly rolls backward out of my field of view so at that point i did not have a second shot at that point he tries to recover two seconds after that the secret service from a different vantage point a higher vantage point takes the killing shot so my final question if i may to the doctor are you here with us doctor yes, dr I am. goldschmidt you stated sir and i know you're doing your best you performed the autopsy i've observed your work i think it was very professional work in my opinion you stated that there was only one bullet wound i accept that you had only one observable bullet wound are you there doctor yes i am thank yes, you very much could the injuries on crook's shoulders have been caused by a combined impact of butler county esu shot number nine striking somewhere in the vicinity of the buttstock of crook's rifle and some fragmenting from that impact could the injuries on crook's shoulder have been caused by a combination of shot number nine and shot number 10. Is that possible? No, I don't believe so. You don't believe it's possible. Does that mean it's possible? No, it's not possible. It's not possible. So I respect your testimony. But how would you determine if you remove only one fragment of a bullet? The FBI recovered no other bullets. That's our understanding. No other projectiles other than the partial projectile that you recovered from his shoulder. So you don't know where shot number nine went, did you, doctor? Correct. Okay. Not. So is it not possible? You're saying it's not possible that shot number nine went all the way through crooks and you had no way of knowing that because it was in the same wound that was further affected by shot number 10. You're saying that's not possible. Interesting. There was no evidence on the body of that occurred. There you go, sir. That's different than impossible. I think what we heard him say is that maybe the bullet or a portion of the bullet from shot number nine, which was from the local sniper. Remember crooks was there kind of posting up on the roof and the sniper from the local cops came, hit the butt of the rifle, theoretically exploded the back of the rifle then he stands up oh and then secret service pops him right there and he's done now did this one okay come down this direction go through the head or through the face and then hit the shoulder simultaneously with that other sniper shooting and hitting the butt stock right so it's like through here into here and here see that all going into each other maybe you couldn't see that because it looked like you know they went through the same trajectory or something or a shrapnel from when it hit this hit this shoulder you know it's the same wound that he couldn't differentiate the two of them. So interesting line of questioning there from Clay Higgins. They took a lunch break. The Democrats stormed out of there like little babies. And the Republicans called in Representative Corey Mills, who is somebody who is a combat veteran. And so they brought him in to see what he had to say about this. And here's how that went. Confidence that we did what we were supposed to do, what we were tasked to do. So I thank you so much for being here. You all have kept that standard up. Now recognize Representative Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to first take a moment just to correct the record that my actual time as a designated defensive marksman and counter sniper was as a contractor of the U.S. State Department on a protective detail, not as a military sniper. So I was honored to serve as a combat veteran with the 82nd Airborne Division. I don't hold that permissibility in that billet. I want to talk today a little bit about yeah, not, what took place, but also what I see as the actual like perimeter walls, failures that has nice. continued to be a reoccurring issue, whether we that be in that. Butler, PA, or whether it be the most recent assassination attempt in Florida. But before I do that, I also want to take a moment just to recognize the loss of Corey Compitor. His family deserves to continue
continue to have the accountability research and also investigation into what actually caused the death of a father, a husband, and a family member. My thoughts and prayers remain with Corey Compatore's family. Cheers and amen. I also want to look at what our findings have been as both myself and my colleague and really close friend, Rep Crane, has found. It is clear that Butler County PA, as well as for the ESU teams and the Secret Service, had a failure in their overall coordination. That the perimeter establishment and the actual ownership belongs to that of the Secret Service, as well as for the failures on that day of July 13th in Butler, PA. We realize, as it's been mentioned earlier, that there was a breakdown in not only the misuse of any compatible communication capabilities, but also a lack of a joint operations center that could have allowed for each of the individual units to be able to communicate in a more efficient fashion that would have led to a faster response element. We also know that while there could have been potential drone capabilities that was being utilized, that the Secret Service themselves had actually refused to utilize those for their benefits, which also could have helped the counter snipers who were sitting in their positions. There was also a lack of coordination when it came to who was actually going to take over the position on the AGR building, where Butler understood the idea that it was the Secret Service who was responsible for the positioning, but yet the Secret Service failed to actually show up to the morning coordination meeting. While all of these repeated perimeter failures, whether it be the 150 meter shot that was taken by Thomas Crooks or the potential assailant that was looking at a 500 yard distance from Florida, the thing that we've established is, is that no one is looking at what is happening and going on with regards to the Secret Service's cultural issues. This is not a budgetary issue, and I want it to be clear that we cannot treat this as DC has continued to treat things where we throw money at problems in hopes that it's actually going to cause that to be a solution. This breaks it down into three simple things. One is poor leadership of the United States Secret Service, yeah. whether that be under Director Cheadle or whether that be under Roe. To quote Dan Bongino, who is actually a former Secret Service Shout agent, out. he said that he does not feel any safer or better now than he did under Cheadle having Roe in the helm. I think leadership, as we can all admit to you, whether it been in the military, the police force, or whether it be here in the House, leadership is one of the things that we must rely upon heavily, and there is a crisis in leadership. I also want to look at the fact that there is a prioritization across not just our military, but other departments and agencies to prioritize diversity, equity, inclusion under DEI, the <laughs> meritocracy and readiness of our actual capabilities on the ground. And we saw but that. But the further thing that I think is needed to be explored when nobody is the doctrine on the itself that is being all. utilized by the U.S. Secret Service. For too long, they've continued to go under a very specific and very understandable thing where whatever your title is that you hold results in the amount of resources and assets that are being allocated. This is a failure by any of us who understand security or anyone who's even got a basic knowledge of security that you must conduct the necessary threat analysis to determine the risk management matrix that then determines what the assets and resources that should be allocated. This is not as simple as saying that you're a former president and therefore there is a one-size-fits-all for Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, President Bush, or former President Donald J. Trump. That's right. We must acknowledge the fact that what we're looking at now is also the fact that so much time has passed and so much and they burn the of the actual too. potential evidence has been destroyed yeah, or body. put away. That purposeful intent is now indistinguishable from criminal negligence. Having laid in the actual position where Thomas Crooks took the shot above and upon the AGR building, as well as having sat with Rep Crane and ranged the position from the counter sniper teams where the alleged shot was taking place, this is something that should have been preventable and should have been known to the counter sniper teams. I want to also point out the fact that as Rep Crane discussed, I think that until the actual problem and the solution can be found for the Secret Service with the three key areas that I've talked about, that a private security detail who does not have any political agenda or affiliation to protect the president is what my recommendation would be to ensure that the inner core is basically protected at all times, yes. utilizing his available Secret Service assets and resources to be pushed out further to allow that perimeter failure to be completed. I want to thank the task force for giving me the opportunity to actually testify before you. And I want to point out that when we're looking at the map that's behind you, Mr. Chairman, that it is not just the AGR building 150 yards away approximately that was the issue. But even if you look directly to the 12 o'clock of the stage, you have the Kubota dealership, which is only within about a 400 yard shot placement, which Rep Crane and many snipers and counter snipers can tell you is a very feasible shot. Maybe up here. When speaking to the Kubota dealer, we noted the fact that not a single Secret Service or local law enforcement agent had ever talked to that dealership to ask them whether or not they could put any snipers on the rooftop Nuts. or whether or not they could actually utilize that as an overwatch position. If you look to the what would be from my vantage point right now, which is the three o'clock, which would be the nine o'clock for the president, that was the area that was actually the third counter sniper team that one of our whistleblowers, Ben Schaefer, had talked about from his vantage point and being able to see Thomas Crooks at an earlier time. Mr. Chairman, I point these things out to the committee and again to echo my good friend, Representative Crane. I challenge you to continue to go forward and to not be feared away from the idea of being labeled
able to conspiracists by looking into every possible outcome. Exactly being able to look right. at every possible provided video. Listen to every single testimony of each individual whistleblower. But I also pledge my continued support for the task force, as does Rep Crane, to provide information, intel, and any of our findings to help further this investigation. While it is an independent investigation, I want you to know that it is not exclusive of the efforts in which you are taking and that we are here to work together to try and find a solution to improve our secret service and to guarantee the protection of not just President Donald J. Trump, but any of the actual nominees on either side of the aisle. Thank you so much for this opportunity. All right. So that was Corey Mills, representative, and he's out there in Florida. And so we had a full hearing today. We'll see what the task force does next. They are, of course, conducting a bunch of interviews. They have a bunch of letters out. And so far, the Secret Service apparently has not been very forthcoming, as we've seen in other reports, like the Senate report that came out from Rand Paul that we covered yesterday on the show. So if the Secret Service and Homeland Security and the rest of these federal agencies are not willing to play ball with Congress, why is Congress playing ball with them? Why is Congress continuing to fund them while they're not even recording their radio calls? 